Okay, so today we're going to be going over um, EKGs, um, how to read them, and how to essentially do the exercises in your lab book, um, and then going beyond that a bit by understanding how to look at an EKG and determine if something is wrong and what specifically is wrong um, with that EKG. So you'll need to have a pretty firm grasp of um, just basic cardiac physiology. So if you haven't gotten there in lecture yet, um, or if you need a review of it, make sure you go to my YouTube channel, which you're already on, so <laughs> you know where that is, um, and look in the um, lecture videos for the cardiac physiology video, and then also the EKG um, video with the cardiac volumes associated with that video. So you'll get that background information and do that before you watch this video. Um, so what I have here is just a real quick um, drawing, essentially, or a brief review of what an action potential is like in a cardiac muscle cell. So just to quickly make sure we're all on the same page with this, we have our um, depolarizing graded potential, then we hit um, threshold, which is where we open our voltage-gated sodium channels. We depolarize sharply when we open those voltage-gated sodium channels, and then when we reach the peak, we close those sodium channels. We open voltage-gated potassium channels, so we start to um, repolarize a little bit as potassium leaves the cell, um, but at the same time we're opening L-type calcium channels. L-type means long-lasting, they are slow, so it takes them a little bit of time to open, but once they do, calcium comes into the cell and it holds it at this depolarized um, flat spot here for a pretty lengthy period of time in terms of action potential um, time, uh, time frame. So this is called the plateau right here. And then by the end of the plateau, this is when those L-type calcium channels finally close, calcium stops coming in, potassium continues to leave, no sodium can come in because we have those um, inactivation gates still closed for the sodium channel. So we repolarize all the way until we get down to where we return to normal permeability. Um, and then potassium, because those potassium channels are kind of slow to close, we overshoot a bit and we end up with a hyperpolarization. So the important thing here, of course, is this absolute refractory period where the um, inactivation gates of the voltage-gated sodium channels are closed. Um, this absolute refractory period is extended, which means that um, this time period when you can't stimulate the muscle again is longer than in, say, a skeletal muscle. Um, and it means that the contraction happens entirely within the absolute refractory period. So you can't have wave summation, you can't have tetanus because of that. Now this is a picture of um, what's happening electrically in one cell. The EKG, on the other hand, is a picture of what's happening electrically in all of the cells. So it's, say, if we're having this, which if you remember from lecture, um, P is representing atrial depolarization. So when we're having P, all of the cells in the atria are doing this. When we hit like the peak of P here, that means that they're all pretty much hitting their um, peak of their action potential. They're all um, uniformly depolarized. For QRS, this is where we have the ventricles depolarizing. So all of the cells in the ventricles are doing this. By the time we hit R, which is the peak of this um, QRS complex, we have um, the cells in the ventricles being at the peak of their um, action potential. Um, now also during QRS, we'll have the atria going into their repolarization. Um, you can't see it on the EKG because it's obscured by this really large electrical activity of the ventricles depolarizing. Um, and then we get to T, and that's where the ventricles are repolarizing, so all the cells are doing this part. Um, now, important to remember that systole of the chambers doesn't actually happen um, right at the beginning of the depolarization of each of the chambers because that would be like right here. So you're not contracting, you're not going into systole yet. You have to wait till you're fully um, contracted and where you're all completely depolarized and, and um, building tension until you get to systole. So you start the depolarization of the atria here at the beginning of P, but you don't start contracting until about the middle of P, and it'll last until about Q when they start to repolarize. Um, now at QRS, again, this is where the 
ventricles are starting to depolarize, but you don't start contracting um, until you've hit, hit the peak. So it's somewhere on this downslope from R to S. Conventionally, you would just say that systole happens from S to T, um, but it's probably more somewhere around there. Um, you have to wait, as this is the peak of the depolarization up here, um, the contraction takes a little bit of time after that, and then you also have to um, think about that isovolumic contraction where you're squeezing but you haven't ejected yet. So you're really ejecting the blood between S and T. And then here at T, the ventricles are going into this. Um, then you have that period where everything's relaxed, nothing's depolarizing or repolarizing, it's just a regular resting potential, and that would be the diastasis period where it's just passive filling. Um, and all of this is one cardiac cycle, one heartbeat, and then you start over again, and this would be the second heartbeat. <coughs> okay, so the fun part, reading the EKG in terms of um, time, how long things take, and strength of signal. So um, just how many millivolts we're seeing, how much um, electrical charge or electrical change we're seeing. And it's important to note that, um, like here, it makes sense that it's going up. It's a depolarization. Um, and same with QRS. Um, but then you go, okay, well, T, that's going up, but it's a repolarization. And you might think, well, that should be upside down or something, but it's not because it's just an absolute value. It's the strength of the signal, um, not indicating whether it's a positive or a negative signal. So you're just seeing how strong that repolarization is. <coughs> um, now, for change in time or how long something takes, that's delta T. The word, or the symbol delta just always means change. So delta T um, is the change in time. You could think of delta T as, um, you know, the delta T from now till the end of this lecture is um, probably about 10 minutes, I hope. I don't know, don't hold me to that. Um, so you could think of it that way, or the delta T from now to the end of the semester is about a month, um, for real. <laughs> so um, don't think of delta T as being specifically one part of this EKG or one set part, it's any part. I could say, what is the delta T of P? So how long was it from the start of P to the end of P? Or what was the delta T from QRS? So you would just go how far from Q to S. Um, or I might ask, what is the delta T from um, the beginning of atrial systole to the end of atrial systole? So you would go kind of from the middle of P to the Q. Or what is the delta T from um, the beginning of ventricular systole to the end of ventricular systole? And you would go from S to T. So I can ask delta T on pretty much anything. So you need to know what each of the parts of the EKG mean. Um, and then you need to also be able to measure how long they took. So when you look at an EKG, and I'll have some example EKGs up and you can also just do a Google Images search and find a ton of EKGs in practice um, doing this. And this is something you'll need to do on the test because I will be asking you what is the delta T of things. So when you're looking at it, you'll notice kind of what I, I'm going to call them big boxes. So these like kind of darker lines and they'll be spaced um, pretty well apart, not super far apart, but about like this. This is a decent representation of where those bigger blocks would probably be on a typical EKG. And then each one of those little or bigger box is going to be divided into smaller boxes. And there are typically, it depends on how far the EKG picture is zoomed in, but typically what you'll see is a scale where you have the big box and then you have one, two, three, four, five little boxes inside of that. So keep that in mind. Each big box is worth five little boxes. So then you look at what the big boxes are worth. So this would be 0, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, I go on and on. You can see, obviously, I'm going up by 0.2. So each big box is 0.2. Does everybody see that? So 0.4 minus 0.2 is 0.2. 0.6 minus 0.4 is 0.2. So always if you're at this particular zoom, if this is a scale, this is a very common scale for an EKG, you'll have this um, 0.2 difference. 
Um, now, you might have a situation where it's a different number, in which case you'd have to figure it out um, in a different way, but we'll just use this as our example. So we know that from here to here is 0 0.2. We also know that there are five little boxes in here. So we've divided this bigger box into five little boxes. So if this is 0 0.2 and there's five little things in there, then we do 0 0.2 divided by 5. Um, now you can use your calculator for this, but if you just think 20 divided by 5 is 4, and then you put the decimal point in there two times, so 0 0.04. So 0 0.2, because that's how far it is from one big box to the other, and then divided by 5, because there are five little boxes that the big box is divided into. So what that means is that every little box is worth 0.04. So let's say we wanted to, and let's just use this one where we have it already drawn out. Let's say we wanted to go from the beginning of P to the end of P. And let's just pretend that that is right on the line there, just to make our lives a little bit easier. Um, and this one is right on the line. So we're measuring beginning of P to the end of P, and we go one, two little boxes, they're each worth 0.04, so 0.04 times 2 equals 0.08. Or you could count it in your head and go 0 0.04, 0 0.08. If it was a third box, it would be 0.12. If it was a fourth one, it would be 0.16, and so on and so forth. Um, now, we can also find the heart rate using this delta T method um, and the EKG. So... The way that we do that is we need to first find the delta T from R to R. So from one R to the very next R. So I've conveniently put the R's right on the big boxes. And this is just to make it easier to count. So we know that each big box is worth five little boxes. So we can just count by fives as we go through here. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 boxes from R to R. So our delta T from R to R is 25 times 0.04. Um, okay, I'm going to have to use my calculator for that one. 25 times 0.04. 1. I should be able to do that. Okay, so our delta T from R to R is 1 second. And actually, I could have done that a million times easier just by looking at the graph. Okay, okay, here's one R, here's the next R. The second R is at 1.6, the first R is at 0.6, 1.6 minus 0.6 is 1. So that would have been an easier way to do it. So you can also read the graph that way. Um, now, that's just our delta T from R to R. We haven't found the heart rate yet. In order to get the heart rate, we're going to do 60 divided by um, the delta T. So that's easy, 60 divided by 1 equals 60, and that's beats per minute. Um, and that is a regular, normal, resting heart rate. Um, if you get a number that is like 300 beats per minute or 2 beats per minute, this is not a good number to have, and it means probably that you have either flipped this equation around backwards um, or that you have miscalculated your delta T. So if you get a cuckoo answer, for your heart rate, um, double check your delta T measurement, double check um, that you have the equation in the right order. Um, now, for millivolts, this is easier. Um, this is called the amplitude of something. So it's how many millivolts it is. And if we just want to read straight across, let's say we're looking for the amplitude of R, and we just read over, and that's at 0.2 millivolts. So there's the amplitude. Um, now if we look at the amplitude for Q, it's so maybe a third of the way, or maybe we could ha call it half. Don't agonize over, you know, is that a third or is that a half? Let's just call it half. Um, so it's half of 0.1, so it would be um, 0.05, but it's negative because it's below the zero mark. So the um, amplitude of Q here would be negative 0.05. Um, now, if we wanted to do something, which we will want to do something called get the net QRS, we get the amplitude of R 
which we said was 0 0.2, um, the amplitude of Q, which was 0 0.05, and then S is pretty much on a line with Q, so we'll call that um, also 0 0.05. Um, and both Q and S are negative, so we're going to add those together, and because they're negative, we'll keep them negative. So I always start with R. I think it's just easier in life because when you're doing, especially when you're using a calculator like this, um, you don't have to fool with a negative sign. Um, you just subtract out Q and S because they'll tend to be negative. If they were positive, you would add them, but they're negative. So um, we do 0 0.2 minus 0 0.05 minus 0 0.05, and that gives us 0 0.1 as our net QRS, and that's going to become important. Um, in a little bit for this graph. Um, this graph is dealing with something called Eindhoven's Law, so you need to know what Eindhoven's Law is, and it's just a way of plotting um, the net QRS for two different leads. Um, each EKG picture that you see is called a lead. This is just one lead in a, like a hospital setting. You're going to get um, up to 16 leads showing your heart with an EKG from different electrical viewpoints. Um, but for this Eindhoven's Law, you're going to get this for um, just two. And you're going to use this graph, which you'll find in your lab books, to plot out um, essentially the QRS, the net QRS for both of those leads, which are called um, net QRS1 and net QRS3. Um, then you draw lines in a way that I'm about to show you, and you can come up with something called the mean electrical axis which is the angle um, that your um, heart is sitting in your chest, and then the mean electrical magnitude, which is um, just the average of the net QRS1 and the net QRS3. So these little hash marks are all equivalent to 0.1. So let's make up some numbers. Let's make our net QRS1 be 0.5, and we'll make our net QRS3 be 0.4, um, let's say, and then we just plot them. So one, two, three, four, five. And then for net QRS3, one, two, three, four. And then we're going to draw our line. So for lead one, we just draw it straight down. So it's perpendicular to the um, axis of the graph. Now you'll notice that this axis isn't going straight down, it's going at kind of a diagonal. So I'm going to draw this line perpendicular to this graph, sort of far over there. So it's not going straight across. That's the most common mistake people make is they make it straight across. It's got to be perpendicular. You're going to get a funky reading. Um, and then we just note where the intersection of the lines are. Let me go back to the origin of the graph. That's the zero, zero mark. And we draw a line straight through from the origin straight through the intersection. And what we're looking at is where that line crosses this outer graph. And there'll be a bunch of degrees out here. Let's say this is 90, and let's call this 60, and that would be 120. Um, so the way I just drew it, we put that line directly um, through at the 90 degree mark. So that's our mean electrical axis. And the mean electrical magnitude is the average of these so you just add them together, divide by 2, so that would be 0.45. And there is your information that you needed to get from that graph. Okay, so let's look now at abnormal EKGs. And see, I was lying about that delta T being 10 minutes. It's, it's going to be just another, like, 5 minutes or so, I think. <coughs> Don't hold me to that. Obviously, I lie about that. <laughs> but um, anyway, abnormal EKGs. Um, when you're looking at an EKG, if you um, normally would see, like, everything sort of discrete, P, Q, R, S, T. But in these two, you're going to end up with something called a shortened PR interval. And that's where you have P and, oops, you're like in Q, R, S right away. Um, so the difference, the delta T from P to R is super short. Um, so you don't have a lot of time to fill the ventricles. Because of this, you're at least getting to finish atrial systole before you start the ventricles contracting, but you're just not getting a lot of time um, in between the two. So both of these are going to give you that shortened PR interval. 
Now for this one, Wolf Parkinson White Syndrome, you're also going to get this funny little hump there. So P, Q, R, and S um, come too close together. You have that shortened PR interval, but then you get this little hump. Instead of it just going straight up, it's going to be P, Q, R, and like this lumpy weird thing here. Um, that's called the delta wave. And why that delta wave is there is that there is a bundle of Kent present um, in your conducting system, where normally you just have the SA node, then to the AV node, then the AV bundle, and that AV bundle is supposed to be the only electrical connection between the atria and the ventricles. But here, in um, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, you've got this extra thing in addition to the AV bundle, and that's called the bundle of Kent. And that does not do that delaying thing that the AV node and the AV bundle do. It just sends the information straight down, or it sends the actual potential straight down into the ventricles, which is why it's happening too soon, um, and why you get this sort of extra lumpy look here. Um, now, langenong levine syndrome, this is also um, where we're bypassing the AV node um, because we're not using that SA node to the AV node to the AV bundle and down into the ventricles. We're just having um, just a complete bypass of that. So there's no delay using the AV node where the AV node delays sending that actual potential down into the ventricles. Um, but because there's still just one connection, there's not the AV bundle plus the bundle of Kent, there's just this other um, bypass of the AV node, you don't get that little delta wave like you do in Wolf Parkinson White, but you do get the shortened PR interval because you're not delaying the signal going down. So these two I would ask in question form only. I wouldn't ask you to look at these on an EKG in your PowerPoint notes. They're there as examples, and if you look at them, you, you need to have really good eyesight for one um, to even just see them. It's, it's a pretty subtle look on the EKG, but if you understand them in words, that's how I'll test them. Um, now, something I would show you possibly on the test is a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, um, and this is really obvious to see. You just have, you know, there's P, Q, uh-oh, something went really, really wrong. Um, this is called an elevated ST segment, and this is what it would look like if a person were having a heart attack. So here they're fine, they're okay, everything's fine, and then not so fine anymore. And it just looks like you can just tell it looks crazy. And if you look at the example in your PowerPoints, um, you can see right away something's wrong just right off the top. If something really screams out, that's weird. Um, it's typically going to be a myocardial infarction. But look specifically for that elevated ST segment. Okay, now for um, premature ventricular contractions, or PVCs. These are um, actually pretty common things. Um, sometimes people have a condition where they get them um, often, which I actually do get these quite a bit. Um, but this is something you may have experienced. You probably have or you probably will at some point in your life. Almost everybody gets them occasionally. Um, where if you're kind of stressed or if you drink too much caffeine and you get that feeling where your heart is doing like a flip-flop, like a somersault thing, and it's like, ugh, that feels weird. Um, that's a premature ventricular contraction. So what's happening is that you get an ectopic pacemaker. And the word ectopic just means um, something that is not where it's supposed to be. It's outside of where it normally is. So in this case, it would be um, just some regular old muscle cell in the ventricle. So just a cardiac muscle cell sitting there in the ventricles. And it just depolarizes on its own from some stimulus, whether that stimulus is stress, um, caffeine, um, ion imbalances can cause this. Um, various, lots of things can cause this. Chocolate <laughs> can make me do do these like crazy. Um, but if that happens in the ventricle, you get a PVC, and it just spreads then from that one particular little cell out to the others, and it causes the ventricle to contract and depolarize too soon. So here you are on an EKG, and this one is really easy to spot on the EKG too. You get your regular P, everything's fine, QRS, everything's fine, T, and then, wait a minute, where's P? You're right, in QR, then you get this weird deep S thing going on, and then you get kind of like a long break, like, ah, my heart's not going, and then you start up again. 
So the keys to this, um, one, there is no P, just T right into QRS. That's because P is happening under QRS and you just can't see it. Everything is contracted at the same time, which is why it feels so wonky when that happens. Um, the deep S is as you have this like really hard contraction um, going on. And then the skipped heartbeat, this is where everything's an absolute refractory for a long period of time, kind of recovering from this intense stimulus. Um, so this one, easy to spot. If you just look for that really deep S, that is a giveaway of a PVC. Um, now premature atrial contractions, this one I won't ask you to identify on um, an EKG, but I would ask it as a question, so if you can describe it verbally. It's the same idea as a PVC, but it's something that's happening in the atria instead, so an ectopic pacemaker in the atria. And what it looks like on an EKG um, is that the P wave might be hidden under the T, so you would still have sort of the situation, that's why I didn't want to include it um, as a picture that I would ask you to see, is that it would still look like you just don't have a T or a P. You would have the T and then no P and go right into QRS because the P would be happening in the T, um, essentially. But you just went, you would not have that deep S. So that's how it looks different from a PVC. Um, or you just might have a funky, lumpy looking P going on there. Um, okay, now for these last two, so very close to the end here. Um, these last two are dealing with Eindhoven's Law. So this mean electrical axis that you found. And um, if it's greater than 90 degrees, that's called a right axis deviation. And if it's um, less than negative 30 degrees, it's called a left axis deviation. Um, if it's the right axis deviation that a person has, um, there are some possible causes for it. And these are the causes that I would want on the test. Um, there are other things, factors that are more temporary that can um, cause these to just show up on an EKG temporarily, but I want to know the, the physiological reasons like this. So um, for the right axis deviation, dextrocardia, this is where the heart is on the right side of the body instead of on the left. So the person is just sort of flip-flopped, um, which they may go all through life without even knowing that until they got an EKG and saw that they had a right axis deviation. Um, it could also be due to a left posterior fascicular block. Um, this is referring to um, the, um, the fasciculi of axons that are going to the back of the left ventricle. Um, so if you're thinking like to the conducting system, to the AV branches, and then through the, or the AV branch, and then the bundle branches, and the Purkinje fibers going out into the ventricles, you're having a block there going to the back of the left ventricle. Or it could be referring to a high lateral myocardial infarction or a heart attack happening high up on the side of the heart. For a left axis deviation, so a very low um, mean electrical axis, that could be a left anterior fascicular block. So same idea, block um, conducting to the um, front left side of the, ventri the left ventricle. Um, or it could be a heart attack happening down low. Okay, so I apologize for the super long video. That is it. Um, I'll be posting um, some practice EKGs and some practice questions as well as an assignment for um, all the biopack um, things. But make sure you're practicing, especially measuring delta T and making sure that you know all of um, what's happening on the EKG and all of the abnormal EKGs. Okay, that's it.